So it happened that after Prahlad had been in school for some time, his father desired to hear from him what he was learning at school. Hmm. Well, just like many of you, your children go to school and when they come home you'll ask them, well, what did your teacher teach you? What are you learning at school? So Aranyakashipu took his son Prahlad on his lap and asked him, my dear son, tell me what is the best thing you're learning from your teacher? So Prahlad Maharaj thought, oh my teacher, now you see Prahlad actually has another teacher, not only the teacher in the Gurukula, but Prahlad had another teacher because while he was in the womb of his mother, we described that the mother, the wife of Harani Kashipu had been taken to the ashram of Narada Muni. And Narada Muni had been describing the glories of the Supreme Lord and telling everything about Bhakti Yoga, the process of loving service to the Supreme Lord. So, when Prahlad hears his father inquire, what is the best thing you have learned from your teacher? Prahlad Maharaj doesn't think what he learned from, you know, these two sons of Sukracharya, because he thought they didn't teach me anything any good. I will tell him what I learned from Narada. He was a good teacher. He taught me real knowledge. So then Prahlad Maharaj told his father the best thing he had heard was Shravanam Kirtan Vishnu Smaranam Padasevanam Archanam Vandam Dasyam Sakyam Atmani Vedanam Iti Pum Shartita Vishnu Bhaktis Chan Naiva Lakshana Any person who is actually desiring, a, 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 a person who understands these nine processes of bhakti yoga, beginning with hearing and chanting and remembering Vishnu, any person who takes up these processes and cultivates the process, these nine processes of bhakti yoga, then it's understood that this person is the most fortunate person and he has the highest education. This is real education to cultivate the nine processes of Bhakti Yoga, beginning with hearing and chanting Vishnu, right? Not hearing and chanting Bollywood or you know, <laughs> cricket or politics or any mundane thing but hearing and chanting about the Supreme Lord, Vishnu. So, of course, Harani Kashipu was furious when he heard this. And he called for the teachers and he said, What kind of education have you been giving to my son? Harani Kashipu thought that if my son is speaking like this, he must have learned this from his teachers. And Harani Kashipu was not aware that Prahlad had had another guru. That Pro, because Harani Kashipu would go on to do austerities for a long time. So his wife was left alone. So it was at that time his wife was in the ashram of Narada Muni. So Harani Kashipu didn't know his son had been associating hearing from Narada Muni. So he was blaming the teachers, and of course the two teachers, uh, the two sons of Sukracharya, they said, ah, we, we didn't teach him this, it's not our fault. And they told Harani Kashipu, you shouldn't criticize us, you'll get reactions for offending a Brahmin. We're Brahmins, you know, and <laughs> they're warning Harani Kashipu, you should be careful how you speak to us, we're Brahmins. So Harani Kashipu was surprised in any way to think, how did my son know this? <coughs> so he, of course, because Vishnu was the enemy of Harani Kashipu. 
Harani Kashipu's own brother, Haranyaksha, had been killed by Lord Varaha, who was Lord Vishnu. So Harani Kashipu had very bitter, nasty feelings towards Lord Vishnu and towards all the devotees of Lord Vishnu. So he warned the two teachers, you have to take care of my son. Don't let any of these Vaishnavas come near him. They will pollute his mind with this kind of thinking. Prabhupada in the purport, he remarks how often when people come to Krishna consciousness, other family members are often opposed to somebody in their family becoming a devotee of Krishna or devotee of Vishnu. They think, oh no, why do why they have to get into this, you see? Because when we become devotees, then our lifestyle is quite different from the life of the materialists. The life of the devotee, you know, we follow regulated principles. We don't just eat anything. We, 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 we don't just do the kind of things which ordinary materialistic people do like going to cinemas. You know, one family I know, the wife is a very good devotee, and the husband, he's not against it, but, you know, he's not himself very interested in it. But because his wife is into it, he tolerates it. So sometimes they want, the family want to go to the cinema. And so then the wife thinks, oh no, you know, because the wife is very attached to hearing and chanting, she loves to study the scriptures and do her pujas and so on. But the husband's not much of a devotee. So sometimes, you know, the family, the husband and the children, they think, yeah, let's go to cinema. It's a good, and the mother's thinking, oh, how, you know, what to do. She also has to go. But she, when she goes, she takes her feet bag with her. <laughs> And in the cinema she will sit and chant, <laughs> which is not very pleasing to the other family members. So these kind of things happen, you know, you, it's, it's very difficult trying to be a devotee when others in the family are not devotees. We had one case, there was one very nice young man, South Indian man who became a devotee. And his family were very much opposed. It was a very, they were a very high class family. And they didn't much appreciate Krishna consciousness. So the young man was, you know, really into being a devotee and he came to live in the ashram and so on, become like a brahmachari, shaved his head and so on. So the mother and father arranged for some people to kidnap him. And after they kidnapped this young man, they, they arranged to give him some drugs so that he would lose his memory, forget everything. So, after, the, after they took the drug, he forgot everything. He forgot who his mother and father was, he forgot everything. The only thing he could remember was Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Remembering Lord Krishna is not material. You see, these other memories which we have about mundane life, that's all material. But remembering Krishna is on a higher level. It's transcendental, very different. You see, this is the difference between the devotee and the non-devotee. The non-devotees, they're under the modes of material nature and their happiness and distress is all according to the modes of nature and their karma. But a devotee is transcendental. One who is engaging in Krishna conscious activities, he's on a different level. He is transcendental to the modes of nature. So the happiness and distress which a devotee undergoes are of a very different nature from the happiness and distress of Karmi, a non-devotee, a fruitive worker. When the devotee undergoes happiness and distress, it's to help us come closer to Krishna. When Krishna
Krishna gives happiness to the devotee is to encourage us in our devotional activities. That we don't deserve such happiness, but Krishna wants to encourage us. And when we're in distress, a devotee understands that the, dis the difficulties have been given by Krishna, but they have been reduced. That we're meant to suffer much more than we're suffering, but Krishna has reduced them to a token amount. So in this way, a devotee understands happiness and distress in a very different way from the materialists. Materialists, they're always endeavoring for happiness. They want to enjoy the material world. They're thinking everything is mine. They do not understand that actually nothing is ours. Everything belongs to Krishna. Everything belongs to God. It's all meant for his pleasure. And we have to use it in the proper way. So Prahlad Maharaj, he understood all of this knowledge. But his father, Arani Kashipu, he's a very different person. You know, his mood is, I am the controller. I am the enjoyer. He wants everyone bowing to him and worshipping him. And they were. He had conquered all the heavenly planets and all these demigods even were being restricted by the activities of Harani Kashipu. But Harani Kashipu had done something wrong. He had given a lot of trouble to the brahmanas by stopping their sacrifice. He had, he had blasphemed the devotees. He gave trouble to the planet Earth and to the cows and to the Brahminical culture. So when one does uh, these kind of things, when one behaves in that manner, then one cannot expect not to be punished. There will be reactions and hellish life is assured for such a person who goes against the Brahminical culture. So Prahlad Maharaj's father put Prahlad back into the Gurukula, told his teachers that you take care of this son of mine. So then Prahlad is back in the Gurukula with his teachers and his teachers are trying to encourage him in understanding the goal of life for a materialist, which is Dharma, Artha and Kama. Right? Practice religiosity, mundane religiosity, in other words, ritualistic religion, to get some artha, to get economic development. And you see this in the, uh, throughout the world, how in the beginning people were pious, and as a result of their piety, they got economic development. But as they got economic development, they became more inclined to sense gratification. Now the Vedic path it allows this, but the Vedic path, after sense gratification, then one is meant to direct one's efforts towards liberation. Right? It's not finished with karma. Dharma, artha, karma, and then moksha. After sense gratification, one should consider how to get liberated from this material world. But what happens is materialistic people only think about artha and kama. Hardly any interest in dharma and no interest in moksha. This is the plight of the people in the Kali Yuga, very attached to sense gratification. And, and just for the pleasure of enjoying their senses, they will undergo great austerities. And as they get more economic development, they don't know how to use it. There's nothing wrong in having economic development if we know how to use it properly. But if we simply waste it in material sense gratification, then one becomes more entangled in material life. You don't get free of samsara. So Prahlad Maharaj was having to go to Guru Kula. Guru Kula is very good 
for their children. It's very important that in the beginning of their childhood, children should get training in spiritual culture. If young children are not trained how to come to the temple and how to bow down before the deity, how to chant the names of the Lord, then it's a great shame. They're, they're not given real education. The real education is to teach people Bhagavad Dharma, not to just teach them mundane knowledge. Bhagavad Dharma can free them from birth and death, and particularly in the childhood, it's very important. Prahlad Maharaj was teaching to his friends in the Guru Kula, and he told them, Komar Acharit Prakno Dharmam Bhagavatami. Kumar means young children up to five years of age. This is the time when they should be cultivating Bhagavad Dharma. We may be thinking, oh, let the children play, let them run around. But actually they should be, they need to hear about Krishna. They need to be coming to temple and taking part in the kirtan and chanting the holy name and hearing the pastimes of the Lord in his different incarnations. When the childhood is in relation to Bhagavad Dharma, then one can grow up remembering these things. Just like Srila Prabhupada described, that both he and his own spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, they were both born in Vaishnava family. So from the beginning of their life, they had the opportunity to see the deities being worshipped and to take part in kirtan and hearing the scriptures. So Prahlad Maharaj, he uh, was not able to learn these things in the Guru Kula. It was the, the Guru Kula for the materialists. And they were being trained only how to how to deal with the enemy, recognizing who is a friend and who is the enemy. Harani Kashipu, as, as, as a king of the demons, he was very much concerned with dealing with the enemies. Of course, the enemies of the demons are the demigods. So Harani Kashipu, as a king of the demons, he was always concerned how to conquer over these demigods, how to take control of them. But Prahlad Maharaj wanted to explain to his father that we shouldn't see any difference between people. We should see everyone the same. Friend, we shouldn't think friend and enemy, but we should see everyone as spirit soul. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna explains, uh, Vijya Vinaya Sampani Brahmani Gavi Hastini Suni Chaiva Swapakecha Pandita Samadarshana. The, the learned sage sees with a gentle equal vision. Uh -huh. oh, a learned person sees with an equal vision. The learned and gentle Brahman, a cow, the elephant, the dog, and the dog eater. He sees them all equally because within every living entity there is Paramatma, the super soul. So Prahlad Maharaj, he had that kind of vision. But Harani Kashipu, because of his materialistic consciousness, he can only think, who is a friend and who is enemy? Who is my enemy? I will have them punished or we'll put them in jail, or we will kill them even. Like this, this is the Asuri Sampat. In Bhagavad Gita, there are two natures, Daivi Sampat and Asuri Sampat. Only two natures. If we are not godly, then we are demoniac. One who practices devotional service, will cultivate the good qualities. One who is not a devotee will simply cultivate all the bad qualities. 
So Krishna consciousness is meant for cultivating the good qualities, to cultivate the mode of goodness. We try to cultivate the mode of goodness, living simply, minimizing the demands of the mind. Of course, we know in materialistic society, it's very difficult. We become very entangled here in this material world. You come to this kind of place, and when you first come here, you come with one bag or two bags. But when you leave here, you take two containers. <laughs> we see people going back to India. They have a container full of all their stuff. When they first came, though, they came with a bag. What happened? This is the materialistic life, you see? Accumulating what is described in by Rupa Goswami in his Upadesh Amrita, Atyahara, Atyahara Prayashascha Prajapu Nemagraha. Right? Rupa Goswami is describing things which are not favorable for practicing devotional service. And the first one he mentions is Atyahara, overeating and over collecting. This is a serious problem for devotees, collecting more than required. <laughs> you, I, I, went, I visited someone's house, I was surprised, I went into one room, I thought it was a shoe shop. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many pairs of shoes, you know. My goodness, yeah. You know? Sometimes it's like that, you know. The wardrobe full of so many clothes. How many clothes can they wear? They can only wear one set of clothes at a time. But we have so many clothes, right? Prabhupada said even the average woman will not be happy unless she has at least 30 saris. <laughs> That's probably average. So, this, this is a uh, the, the, these kind of things, they don't help, they're not conducive to Krishna consciousness. Rupa Goswami is warning us things which are harmful to our cultivation of devotional service. We have to minimize the bodily demands. So, Prahlad Maharaj would, he would explain these things to his kids. The teachers would ask him, where the, the, the teachers would be concerned that Prahlad Maharaj, his, 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 yeah, how he talks, the things he says, it's not like the other boys. The other boys, they were coming also from the family of demons, but they were not like Prahlad. So anyway, the teachers, they were trying to instill into Prahlad the principles of ruling and controlling that whoever is the enemy, you first of all, you try to bribe them, and then if you can't bribe them, then you may have to punish them. Or you may try to flatter them, you may have to try to compromise with them, you know, different approaches, there are four different methods how to deal with the enemy. But Prahlad Maharaj was thinking, who's the enemy? Everyone's equal. We should see everyone the same. Prahlad Maharaj had a Krishna conscious vision, seeing, seeing everybody equal. So when Haranya Kashipu became concerned how his son was becoming so much uh, attached to being a devotee, Harani Kashipu asked Prahlad Maharaj that, where did you get all of this knowledge from? Who, who gave you this? Pro Harani Kashipu was thinking, if Prahlad will tell me who gave him this knowledge, then I can have him killed. Or at least I can punish him. But when Prahlad was asked to have given him this knowledge, well, where he got it from, then Prahlad 
reply in a philosophical manner. He said, what he told his father, Matirna Krishna Paratasvatoba Vibhobi Padita Greha Vratana Adanta Vitgobir Vishatam Tamijram Punas Punacharvita Charvanana. Prahlad Maharaj is telling his father that, you know, there, there's no way you will ever get this knowledge. You don't have to worry about it because you're so attached to materialistic life. You have made the vow to stay in materialistic society, right? This Grihabrat made a vow to stay. So, Matir na Krishna, one has no inclination towards Krishna because their inclination is towards Maya, towards sense gratification. We have to choose between surrendering to Maya or surrender to Krishna. <coughs> surrender to Maya doesn't mean freedom. People think sometimes they say, oh, I want to be free. I like to do things I like, I like, I, you know, I'm free. You people, you do, you Hare Krishna people, you're not free. I can, I'm free. I can do what I like. I can eat what I like. I can smoke. I can drink. You can't do these things. I'm free to do these things. They're thinking free. But that is the illusion. Actually, they're not free. Actually, they're controlled. And we are all controlled. Either we're controlled by Maya or by Krishna. Those who are under this, the illusion that they're free are actually controlled by the material energy in the form of the modes of nature, which they take to them and force them to do things like smoking and drinking and eating meat. These activities are the impulses of the modes of nature which keep them entangled in material life and cause them to take birth again and again in the different species of life. And this, a devotee, however, has a different kind of control. The devotee surrenders to Krishna and they are controlled by Krishna, by his spiritual energy. And by surrendering to Krishna, the devotee actually becomes free from material life and we can go beyond birth and death, free from that will of samsara and enter into the kingdom of God to enjoy eternal life, no more birth and death. That is actual freedom. Freedom is not free to become a dog, free to become a tree. Yes, you're free. Take your pick between the 8,400,000 species of life. But a devotee, they go back to Godhead. They go to the spiritual world, free, beyond birth and death. We have to consider these things. So Prahlad Maharaj was explaining like this to his teachers. They were astonished to hear all of this. However, Harani Kashipu is asking him, where did you get this? Prahlad Maharaj said, first of all, I said, you, you cannot, you, you never understand it yourself because you're so attached to material life. If one is simply attached to sense gratification, then there's no way they'll become Krishna conscious. You made a vow to stay in material life. So how can you become Krishna conscious? But then Prahlad Maharaj goes on, he says, just like a blind man follows another blind man. That is what's happening for the materialist. The blind person, a materialist, is actually someone who's blind spiritually. Just like Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra was blind materially, but he was also blind spiritually. He could not understand the importance of Bhakti Yoga and Krishna Consciousness. So, materialistic people cannot see the real goal of life. So, Prahlad, 
Prahlad Maharaj wants to point out that a blind person follows another blind person, a materialistic person, he takes another blind person for his guru. Just like in the Guru Kula, the, these Sukracharya and his sons, they were the Br Brahminical gurus, they were the gurus, the, the smarter Brahmins, but they're like blind people. They're just attached to rituals which are concerned with economic development and sense gratification. How to satisfy the senses more. That is not the real goal of Brahminical culture. Brahmin, Brahmins are meant to take people out of material life and to teach them about spiritual life, about the nature of the soul. Brahmins are meant to lead people out of birth and death, not to entangle them in more births and deaths. But Sukracharya, because he's Sukra, you know, Siman is is a materialistic guru. So you take that kind of person for your guru, that's like a blind person <coughs> guiding you. Why will you follow another blind? You're blind and you're going to follow another blind person? How can you get any good result? You will simply fall in the ditch. So Prahlad Maharaj explains like this. But then he says, there's only one way you can get Krishna consciousness. Prahlad Maharaj explains, you really want to get, know where I got this Krishna consciousness from? Where did I get this devotion from? There's only one way, one place you can get it. You have to take it from the devotee. You get bhakti from one who's got bhakti, from a bhakta. Find a devotee, find a, a mahatma, and take that, take the dust from their feet and smear it all over their body. Taking the dust from the feet means become their servant, engage in their menial service, and take advantage of their association by association with people who are free from the modes of nature we can become free. We have to take the dust, we have to take the mercy from these great souls. Who's a great soul? Those who are niskinchana, who have nothing material. They have given up the material world. They're not interested in cultivating the materialistic life. Just like Queen Kunti explains in her prayers to Lord Krishna, that those who are on the path of material prosperity cannot know you. Janma Aishwarya Shuta Shabiya Eme Eda Mana Madapuna Naibarha Tivatum Vai Twam Akinchana Gochara. Those who are this kinchana, who have nothing, they've given up everything. That, but if you're on the path of trying to improve your birth, your opulence, your education, your bodily beauty. This is what material life is all about. Go to the beauty parlor, spend so much money, go to the college, get your material education, collect your diplomas. We're trying to improve the material life. But Queen Kunti said, those who are trying for this material way of life, they cannot know Krishna. Krishna is not, the Lord is not understood by these people. Because our interest is so much in the body, we cannot understand the soul. So the first thing in the progressing in spiritual life is to understand our spiritual identity as a soul. And then we should become a little detached from the materialistic way of life. Of course, we need some money, we need some job, we have to help maintain ourselves, but don't become too much enamored or attached to these things. Prabhupada gives an example. Just like train goes on two tracks, 
One track is for the material, one track is for the spiritual. Now if the tracks are not level, then the train will turn over. When the train is overturned, the tracks are not level, train falls over. If we, if we don't balance our materialistic life with our spiritual life, we will get problems. And when the problems come, we won't be able to deal with it. Very important that we need some spirituality in our life. It's not enough just simply to be concerned with economic development. Oh, I have a good job, I'm happy, I'm comfortable. How long can you stay here? How long will we be here in this world? We have to leave. Where are you going to go from this life and the next life? So intelligent, thoughtful people will think about this and they will make some plan. The Vedic system was like this. The, there's brahmachari, the student life, and after student life, then grihas, family life. After family life, then Vanakras life. You have to go on. Just like Prahlad Maharaj, he was telling his father that because you're in, the, you're in this bodily conception of life, you're thinking the body, you have so much anxiety in relation to the body. You might as, you, you're like an animal who has fallen into a dark well. Prahlad Maharaj describes it as Griha Andakupam, the blind well of family life. We're simply thinking economic development, money. We're not thinking about our spiritual goals in life. There has to be the balance. Prahlad Maharaj told his father, Vanam, but uh, you should go to the forest, go to the <coughs> Go to the forest that Prabhupada said, you know, go to the place where Krishna consciousness is prevalent, where there's a strong spiritual atmosphere. Just like when you go to the Holy Dham, when you visit Mayapur or Vrindavan, it's a bit, they're very spiritual places. There's a very powerful spiritual atmosphere there. Just like you come in the temple here, you can feel this is a different place from anywhere else outside because the Lord is here. This is a, spirit, this is a place where the Lord's glories are chanted every day. There's a powerful spiritual energy here. We have to take advantage of this spiritual atmosphere and it will prepare us for our next life. So we have to be cautious. Prahlad Maharaj is warning his father also like this. He wants his father to go to the forest. In Satya Yuga, in, in the time of Prahlad Maharaj, you know, people would go to forest. Prabhupada said, today we cannot go to forest. What we can do though, is come to the Krishna consciousness movement. We should go to the holy places, stay there, do some service there, take advantage of the spiritual atmosphere. If we don't take it back, then we are wasting this valuable human life. So Prahlad Maharaj tells his father the importance of taking the dust from the great devotees, that this is how you can progress in spiritual life. Mahatsevam dwaram mahor vimuktes tamo dwaram yoshitam sangi sangha. It is said, by serving the great souls, the Mahatmas, it opens the doors to liberation. But if we simply serve the objects of the senses, then it takes us into hell, the darkest regions of hell. We want to be conscious of what we're doing, what is our goal, where are we going. We have to think not only about today, we should think also about the future, and future means also next life. People think, when I'm older, I will do this. Just wait, wait till I'm older. And then when we go, I mean, I'm too old now. 
I'm too old. I can't do it. Prabhupada said, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's, so, we should learn immediately. Subhashya Sigram. Now is an auspicious thing. They should be done immediately, without delay. We should take up Krishna consciousness, practice. We don't tell people, give up your job, stop work. We say, continue working. Continue working, but keep a balance between the material and the spiritual. Okay, we will stop and ask, is there any questions? Maharaj, yes, uh, you mentioned uh, <coughs> a person can either be a devotee or a demon. But there are some people, they may not be exactly devotees, but they are uh, good people who are, uh, uh, they may not, uh, so what, where do, do we really call them as demons? Well, Krishna said there's only two natures. One who is not actually, who doesn't have godly qualities, then they have demonic qualities. One is not practicing devotion for the Supreme Lord, then one is simply engaged in sense gratification. Now, they may not be big demons like Kamsa and Sishupao and Harangi Kashipu and so on, but still they're associating with the lower material nature, the modes of passion and so. Even though they may be good people, materially they appear to be good, but they're controlled by the modes of nature. Sometimes a mode of goodness will be prominent, sometimes a mode of passion, sometimes a mode of ignorance. It is the nature of the modes that sometimes passion is conquered by ignorance, sometimes goodness is conquered by ignorance. So even though they appear to be good people, any time they can be conquered by ignorance. So, yeah, they have some good qualities, but they're also influenced by the lower modes. They have the demonic nature. Mm. They may not, we, we, we don't say, oh, you're a demon. But they have to, they associate with the lower modes of nature. Just like Srila Prabhupada had the experience himself. He, he had gone to the post office, he explained, and the man in the post office saying, man in the post office behind the counter was saying to Prabhupada, oh, Swamiji, what is the need of doing all this? I'm an honest man, I don't tell any lies, I'm, you know, I'm a good person. But Prabhupada said to him, he said, you are still under the modes of nature. Sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad. You can't just say, I'm only good. You're not only good, because you're under the modes of nature. One, day, one moment you may be good, next moment you may be a rascal. You can be bad means you're still struggling with the modes of nature. We have to transcend the modes of nature. And the only way we can, can the only way we can overcome these modes of nature is by taking up fully devotional service. Mamchayobayabicharena bhakti yogena sevati. One who is engaged in devotional service he immediately comes to the level of Brahman. He transcends the material nature. So people don't understand that, you see, that we're thinking, no, I'm a good person. Yeah, sometimes you're good. You're not a hundred percent good. And that bad can spread. Just like you have some infection, it can, be, can, it can spread through the body. You have to be very careful. So the only safe place is to take shelter in devotional service. It is said, there's danger in every step. But if we take the shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, there's no danger. A devotee doesn't have any danger. Devotee can go anywhere. He would simply engage in Krishna conscious activity. Of course, we have to become devotee. We're trying to be devotee. To be a devotee is not so easy thing. To come to that platform of pure devotion, pure goodness, this is, takes some practice, some endeavor on that part. But we 
should understand the laws of nature. Very difficult to overcome. How to overcome them? Just by surrender to Krishna. No other way. Any other question? Uh, to our attachment and then, uh, how can we uh, increase our uh, Matirna Krishna? Matirna Krishna, how can we increase our inclination towards Krishna? Well, by association. We said you have to get the association of people who are attached to Krishna. The purpose of this Krishna Conscious Center is for this, that you come here and you get some inclination for Krishna, because the, the whole program is all centered around Krishna, chanting Krishna's name, hearing Krishna's pastimes, uh, seeing the deities, taking Krishna's prasadam, it's all Krishna Conscious activities. So you come here, you get there, you increase your inclination towards Krishna. It's that simple. You come in a so Prabhupada explained, he said, just like somebody is a, a lawyer, so they have the lawyer association, they go and associate with each other. If somebody's a businessman, they have a business association, they associate together. This is the association for devotees, for people who want to get out of material life, who want to cultivate their spiritual aspect of life. So they should come here. Come and take part. Come and associate. Very simple. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shri